Hi, I'm the sociology guy. I am a experienced teacher of sociology and an examiner for one of the major uh, exam boards. Today I'm going to look at some uh, one of the possible questions that could come up on the June 2018 uh, A-level sociology paper one, and this is about education and social policy. Okay, um, just a quick disclaimer before we start. I have absolutely no knowledge of the questions that are coming up on the A-level exams. Um, this is merely quite speculative. Uh, I've created the question and I've created the item. These are, these are based on some of the types of questions you might get for AQA, but they haven't created it. I have created it. It's based on, the, on, on some of the question types that haven't appeared so far on any of the specimen papers or any of the AS or A-level papers up until June 2018. I'm recording this on the 1st of June 2018. The first exam is on the 5th of June 2018. And so far, there has not been a 30 mark question on education and social policy. So this is very speculative. Um, just, uh, just as speculative is the way in which I approach this question. This is one way I would answer the question. There are other ways in which you can do this and still get full marks. This is not a definitive type. Uh, this is not a definitive way of answering the question. Uh, this is just one possible way. OK, so here's the question and the item. Um, the item is very similar to some of the items you would get from AQA. Uh, I'll just read it out. Education policies are introduced by governments to tackle problems within the education system. Over recent years, educational policy has been focused on improving standards in education through introducing methods of measuring the performance of schools. The government has monitored these policies through the creation of a number of agencies, including Ofsted. Further educational policy has been geared towards promoting greater choice for individuals in the type of school they choose to attend, whilst giving parents a greater say in the running of schools. However, some argue that the main purpose of educational policy has been to target underperforming groups and tackle social inequality in the education system. Now, that's the item, and there will be a number of hooks in the item for students to develop. Uh, I always suggest to students they should use the item. The question itself um, says, using material from the item and your sociological uh, knowledge, evaluate the claim that the main purpose of educational policy over the last 30 years has been to create an education market. Now, this is one of several types of social policy questions that could be asked. Um, it, they could ask to evaluate the claim the main purpose of educational policy has been to uh, improve choice. Um, it could be that to it could be to promote competition. It could be to tackle inequality. This is just one type, and I think it is probably more common. There's lots of bits of information um, that we have covered in the specification that you could use on this. So if we look at the item first of all, I've highlighted a few key things that you may want to look at uh, in the item. So education policy has been focused on improving standards is the first one. Now, we could look at this as being the Education Reform Act of 1988, um, which brought in league tables. Uh, and you can see this as well, so like in methods of measuring the performance of schools, league tables again. We can also talk here about standardized testing, the introduction of GCSEs and coursework. Creation of a number of agencies, including Ofsted, there, that is a hint that mentioning Ofsted and sort of like how Ofsted promote greater choice and greater competition in the education um, sector could be used in this essay. Another part we've looked at which moves more into coalition policies is the type of school that they choose to attend. So we've seen an expansion of the different types of school that have happened, free schools, faith schools, um, we've seen the introduction of academies. So there's one other hint that you might get whilst giving parents a greater say in the running of schools. So this is the idea of parentocracy, which you might want to develop in the essay. The other part and the second paragraph of the item hints at how you should be answering this question. It's hinting that not all social policy is targeted towards this and that you may need to discuss some policies that don't. So I've highlighted here underperforming groups and tackle social inequality in the education system. This can be hinting at some of the compensatory policies of new labour, 
It could be hinting at the introduction of free school meals. It can be changes to the curriculum. And these are some of the things that you might want to consider when you're writing this essay. The second thing I want to look at, um, and I need to look at this in isolation, is the question, right? Because the question is asking you to evaluate the claim, which hints very, very strongly that most of your essay needs to be evaluative. On the mark schemes for a 30 mark question, there are 12 marks for AO1, nine marks for AO2, our application, and nine marks for analysis and evaluation. But the idea that you need to evaluate the claim is what separates those students who get into uh, the band 19 to 24 and the band 25 to 30. Coming up with an evaluative conclusion is what will get you closer to 30 marks than anything else. OK, you do have to obviously sort of be able to analyze and apply and, and, and bring evaluation throughout the essay. But an evaluative paragraph will push you right towards the, that top A star grade. The main purpose of educational policy over the last 30 years. Now, this is something that AQA like to sneak in with certain categories. Remember, one of the purposes of sociology is to talk about contemporary society. Now, what I would expect to see in, in this essay is students talking about things from the Education Reform Act onwards in the last 30 years. If you were to talk about the tripartite system or comprehensivization or even the introduction of compulsory education back in, in, in 1940, you know, back in 1870, 1880, 1914, you would just get written down not relevant as an examiner. An examiner would just not mark that part of your exam. So the idea that they're talking about the last 30 years is that they want to make this contemporary. And the final section has been to, to create an education market. Now, marketization of education has been a huge, huge thing in, in the education system over the last 30 years. And really, this is policies that focus on increasing choice so that the consumer can pick where, they're, where what school they want their children to go to and create competition between schools. They are the two key elements of marketization, choice and competition. So policies that promote choice or competition should be um, discussed in this essay. So before we tackle um, the essay itself, I just want to go through some of the educational policies that you may want to discuss in here. Um, I've separated them into two, those that, that explicitly create an educational market and those that may provide another function. Of course, we start off with the ADA Education Reform Act, which brings in this concept of marketization, brings in league tables, brings in standardized testing. We can also talk about the introduction of academies. Now, this appears in both. And I think this is a really important point. When you get a policy that not only tackles inequality, but also promotes marketization, that is a really useful one to use because you get natural evaluation in there. As you can see on the column on the right, the first point I put is the first wave of academization. The first wave of academization was, was, was targeting underperforming city centre schools. Um, it was tackling social class inequality. But then it was expanded by the coalition government from 2010 and rolled out to some high performing schools. And also some schools were forced to become academies. And many people will argue that the introduction of academies actually makes uh, actually expands the marketization of education by allowing private uh, private investment into the education sector. Of course, there's the introduction of Ofsted, which gives parents more choice because it gives them an informed decision about the school that their children are going to. The introduction of free schools and the expansion of faith schools. Um, from the coalition government and even we can go back to new labor when they introduced the expansion of faith schools and how very recently there has been talk about expanding faith schools even more these offer the consumer more choice and the introduction of specialist schools which is again is a new labor policy schools that could um, select a percentage of their intake based upon their aptitude in that in in a certain topic. So schools became specialist art colleges or specialist science colleges or specialist sports colleges, and they could select a percentage of their intake based on students who showed an aptitude for those. They all created markets. 
On the other hand, we have those that provide another function. I've already mentioned the first wave of academization, EMA and bursaries, they were there to tackle social inequality, pupil premium, likewise, reforms to the curriculum in 2000, which saw the curriculum become more inclusive, changes back to linear exams, which were seen as targeting male underachievement, uh, although the tagline was to make examinations more robust. The introduction of GCSEs and coursework obviously has a huge benefit for female achievement and initiatives such as GIST and WISE to tackle kind of the inequality in the sciences between males and females. They are all policies that have another meaning. Uh, they don't necessarily create an educational market. Their main purpose is to do something different. Okay, an introduction. Now, some teachers are split on sort of like whether or not you should do an introduction. For me, personally, I think doing an introduction um, just gives you a little bit of time to think about what you're going to write. As an examiner, and sometimes when I invigilate, the worst thing I see is when students are told to take their, told that they can start and the, they open the page and they put their pen straight to the paper. Um, for me, I, I, I would suggest that sort of you take some time to think. And an introduction is one way in which you can do that, is you can start to talk about some of the issues that you may want to discuss. So that's how I've structured my introduction. Um, looking at it straightforward, I've said education policies over the last 30 years have provided a broad range of functions for students and parents. Some policies, such as the Education Reform Act, which brought in standardised testing and league tables, the creation of Ofsted, the introduction of free schools and the expansion of faith schools, have given students and parents a more informed choice and a wider range of educational opportunities, and can be said to have increased the marketization of education. However, some policies, such as the introduction of coursework, bursaries and EMA, and changes to the curriculum, have been argued, have been argued to create advantages for a range of different social groups instead. Okay. So that introduction, it's not really expansive. It just tells the examiner, I know what the issues are and I've identified a range of these issues. Um, it's a way of putting the examiner, uh, putting yourself forward to the examiner and saying, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. It's a little bit of psychology in a way and you're saying, right, I'm knowledgeable about this subject. I'm going to explain it to you. By no means do you have to do an introduction. Many of the papers I've marked over the years have started with one way in which, and they go straight into it. Um, but for me, I like to see an introduction. So this is just a personal um, preference. Now, as we move on to the main body uh, of, of the essay, uh, it's a 30 mark essay. Now there are no hard and fast rules about how many concepts or points or policies you should develop. Personally, I suggest to my students that they should have six paragraphs. Right? And in those paragraphs, what they need to do is they need to apply um, their knowledge of sociology. They need to explain why this answers the question. Then they need to analyze, show deeper understanding, and they need to evaluate. They need to criticize. They need to find some academic support. They need to suggest what this policy doesn't explain okay so the way i've tackled this um the main body of this essay is that i've broken them down into four different sections so in each paragraph i have apply then explain then analyze then evaluate and i've done this for all six paragraphs um that i'm going to show you paragraph one I always like to start on the side of the debate that has been put forward by the question. So the question asks, um, educational policy over the last 30 years has been to create an education market. So I personally like to start with, yes, it has. And I start to look for the evidence that proves that side of the debate. And then towards the end of the essay, I will then look for evidence that contradicts, contradicts that. So the first thing I've done here is, is I've applied my knowledge of sociology. One educational policy that has helped to create an education market has been the Education Reform Act of 1988. This is me applying my knowledge of sociology and it is an AO2 skill. I've also, by using that one line, has made sure I've linked it into the question. So I am explicitly mentioning that this policy has created an education market. 
Next, I'd move on to sort of like my kind of AO1 skill, which is my knowledge and understanding, which is talking about the aim of the policy. So this act was to, intended to raise standards in education through making schools compete with one another for students. OK, it's basic knowledge, basic understanding. And I elaborate on that with the next part, which is my analysis, is my deeper understanding. It's me showing that I understand the process of how this works, how the policy worked in action. The introduction of lead tables and standardised testing meant that schools' performance could be viewed easily by parents and meant that underperformance might have impacted on future enrolments for school leaders. This was reinforced through formula funding, which placed an emphasis on the school attracting students in order to secure more funding. It can be argued that this policy led to the marketization of education in the UK. OK, what I've done there, a little bit of application at the end. It can be argued this policy led to the marketization of education. I've also explained the possible impacts of league tables, which means that what I'm showing is I'm showing a deeper understanding and therefore get my AO3 um, marks. I follow on from that by evaluating. Now, evaluation can take the form of either positive evaluation or negative evaluation. For me, I am criticising the idea of the Education Reform Act. So, however, critics of the Education Reform Act have suggested that rather than improve standards, it leads to teachers teaching a test. While others, such as Ball, suggest that the idea that parents could choose the best school for their child based upon the information was a myth. And Gerwitz also criticises this in her research on parental choice in education. Of course, I could have expanded on this a little bit further, but given the time constraints of doing a 30 mark essay, um, I think that this is probably sufficient. It, it is explicit and it is relevant evaluation. Um, it is evaluating the point I have already made and therefore would, would, would probably score in the 19 to 24 band. Moving on to the second paragraph, you can see the format again is very, very similar. Uh, start with my application, a further educational policy that has impacted on the emergence of an education market with the introduction of Ofsted. Of course, that is in the item. Ofsted, the Office of Standards in Education, was created to give prospective parents information on the schools that their students could be studying at. Their role is to visit schools and comment upon the standards of teaching and learning and student experience. OK, that's basic knowledge and understanding. Now I'm going to talk about the impact, the impact of Ofsted, which then becomes analysis. I'm showing a deeper understanding of what Ofsted is. The introduction of Ofsted can be said to have increased parental choice in education as parents could easily access information on the best schools in their area and send their children to, one, to the one which fitted the needs of their son or daughter the best. Choice is a key element of the marketization of education and Ofsted reports give parents more information with which to make decisions on their children's schooling. Of course, there are criticisms of Ofsted. Um, the critics of Ofsted have suggested there is not enough focus on the experience of students or the quality of teaching and learning. Some argue that Ofsted decisions are based upon the outcomes of students' results. Furthermore, critics have suggested that Ofsted is mainly concerned with making sure that schools are adhering to government targets rather than ensuring students progress and develop. This is an evaluation. Uh, we have criticised the role of Ofsted. You may notice there's no specific studies there. What we have to remember is that when you're writing this, this essay, um, you know, we are, our expectation is that you are an 18 year old student who has studied sociology for two years, right? And as a consequence, examiners probably wouldn't mark you down um, for making statements such as that. Okay, moving on to paragraph three. Again, we're looking at this idea of um, the educational market. Um, so what I'm focusing on here now is the expansion of um, faith schools and introduction of free schools. So a further policy that has influenced the range of schools in the education market has been the introduction of free schools under the coalition government and the expansion of faith schools under new labour. Free schools could be set up by parents, teachers or community groups and offer provision that might not be available in a local area. Faith schools can select a percentage of their students from a specified religion and are viewed as having better levels of achievement as students are controlled more in these schools. We now move on to the analysis of both of these. Now, because I've put forward two different types of schools, um, the analysis will come from um, kind of two different directions, if you like. 
The increased availability of these types of schools provide parents with an alternative to mainstream, uh, mainstream state education for their children. Parents of certain religious faith may also want their sons and daughters to be educated in a way that represents their own culture and with greater diversity in the UK, expanding faith schools provides an alternative to the secular state system. Furthermore, the influence of globalisation on teaching and learning has led many parents to want to choose alternative methods of teaching for their children and free schools offer an opportunity for them to achieve this. In that analysis, you're showing how this policy fits into the bigger picture of society. Um, we're talking not only about sort of like um, the greater diversity in our society and um, parents wanting their, ch their children to be educated um, following their own faith and their own culture, uh, but we're also talking about the impact of globalization. And, and these are very sophisticated points for an 18 year old um, to make. Our evaluation comes in the form of criticism again. Critics of these schools have suggested that they reinforce class inequalities as many free schools are set up by middle class parents in middle class areas. And um, for example, Toby Young, um, although that didn't really work out too well for him. Faith schools have also been criticised for not adhering to the government's idea of British values. Uh, the Trojan horse scandal you can bring into this in. It's a little bit contemporary. Obviously, it's a little bit contentious as well. Although this could be argued to have been an attempt to tackle social solidarity in society in the wake of the war on terror. You're bringing in something that is not about education. You're showing how education is influenced by other aspects of society. And this is quite sophisticated for an 18 year old. And recently, the government have announced further expansion of faith schools due to parental demand. Again, this links in to the idea of more choice, parental demand. More parents want to send their kids to faith schools, so the government responds and opens more of them. Paragraph four on the same theme here, um, the introduction of market uh, academization. A further policy that has helped to create an education market was the academization of schools that was expanded during the coalition government. Uh, the coalition government allowed schools to opt out of local education authority control and attract private investment to turn into an academy. That is just basic knowledge and understanding. But what this means is what you will discuss when you are doing your analysis. This process meant that there was an investment in the teaching and learning facilities of many overcrowded and underfunded schools. It also allowed schools to hire experts in the field rather than qualified teachers, which was particularly useful for shortage areas such as science and vocational qualifications. Academies also benefited from the expertise of other schools in the academy chain and contacts the school may develop through private industry. This gave parents a choice between private and public operation of schools that they sent their children to. This is important. Um, I think academization um, has, has occurred. The, the, the vast majority of schools now are academies. I think around about 50% of secondary schools um, are, seen, are, are academies. Um, and it has had a huge impact on the marketization of education. But we can still um, evaluate this. The first wave of academization can be seen to not have increased market choice, but to address inequality in society. When it was rolled out by New Labour, academies were mergers of underperforming city centre schools that boosted standards through additional investment. The marketization of these can be said to be based upon the success of a policy that was geared towards helping iron out inequality in society. That is quite a sophisticated point to make. You're suggesting that the main purpose of the policy was to tackle inequality. However, because it was successful, it was rolled out to everybody and became part of an education market. Parents could see the success of academies and they could choose to send their students to uh, their students, their, their sons and daughters to the academy uh, because it was seen as being successful. Uh, you could develop this a little bit further and say that not all academies are successful. Um, a good academy like a good state school or like a good comprehensive performs well. A bad academy is like a bad state school or bad comprehensive. They don't perform well. Um, and this fits into the idea of choice. OK, so now I'm going to switch and um, kind of focus. I'm going to look at the other side of the debate, which is that education policy hasn't created an educational market or is not geared towards completely um, marketizing education. So 
To start out with the application, I'm showing that I'm changing direction. Not all educational, uh, uh, educational policy has been targeted at educational markets. Some legislation has been geared towards addressing inequality in society. One such policy is the implementation of the national curriculum. As part of the Education Reform Act, the national curriculum was intended to ensure that all students, regardless of background, were taught specific knowledge and skills to enable them to progress. Basic understanding there. I'm going to boost it a little bit further with my analysis. Based upon a Christian ideology, the national curriculum challenged gendered stereotypes of subjects that boys and girls could choose. Metalwork and design and technology were no longer the preserve of boys, whilst girls were no longer forced into doing secretarial skills or home economics. And this changed girls' aspirations and alongside the introduction of coursework helped girls to overachieve in comparison to their male counterparts. The analysis there has brought in a couple of different points. Subject choice, okay? Girls um, overachieving. If we look back at our trends prior to the Education Reform Act, girls weren't doing as well in education as boys were. Now they overachieve in comparison to boys. Of course, this can be ev evaluated. The national curriculum um, is enforced upon um, school, was, well, was enforced upon schools in 1988, which meant that it might not have reflected the local diversity. However, it can be argued that national curriculum enforced these changes through assimilation rather than integration. Critics have suggested that national curriculum enforced the dominant culture of the white middle class upon all students, and it wasn't until changes to the curriculum approaching the millennium that the national curriculum included non-white middle class groups. You could develop this further. You could talk about Section 28, the banning of teaching homosexuality. Um, you could look at the ethnocentric curriculum, how you know it was based on white middle class history. We were looking at white middle class literature. And you can see some of the changes that happened around about the millennium to be more inclusive of the greater diversity in British society. My second point and my final paragraph of the main body um, is looking at um, how educational policy um, tackled educational inequality through giving more money to students who needed it. Policies such as education maintenance allowance, EMA, and pupil premium were targeted at students who came from the lower socioeconomic backgrounds to ensure that they had adequate access to resources. Furthermore, EMA, EMA provided working class students with an incentive to continue in education by providing them £30 a week towards their travel costs, purchasing books, and other associated costs. Pupil premium saw schools receiving additional funding for those in the lower socioeconomic areas to help develop provision for these students to succeed, such as learning mentors and achievement coaches. However, both of these policies um, came under attack from the coalition government during the time of austerity. EMA was scrapped as the legal age for leaving education was raised to 18 and pupil premium had further conditions placed upon it. Critics have suggested that EMA have, uh, was falsely claimed in man many areas. And um, what you found is, is, is people claiming that they were living with their grandparents because their income fell below threshold. While pupil premium was redistributed from urban to rural areas to schools that had smaller enrollments than city centre schools. One of the coalition um, arguments was that some of the small rural schools didn't have the budget because they had a smaller enrollment. So it was reallocated, um, which was taking money from the underachieving city centre schools and putting it into rural schools where achievement was quite high. Which then leads me um, into my what I would call a smart ass paragraph. Now, I can't take credit for this idea. I took this idea of a smart ass paragraph from a sociology teacher called Steve Bassett, and he has some um, web videos up as well. Uh, I'm using John Oliver as an example of a smart ass. Anybody who's ever seen um, This Week Tonight with John Oliver would know that sort of like he is. This is the opportunity for students to show their sophisticated knowledge of sociology, of politics, and put it all together and come up with an evaluative paragraph that kind of knocks the socks off the examiner. This is what, this is where students can show that they are an A-star student by seeing the bigger picture, right? So I've attempted a smart ass paragraph and here it is. In conclusion, it can be argued that the main purpose of educational policies have been to serve an ideological function for the government of the day. 
from the 1988 Education Reform Act, which set the ball rolling for the marketization of education, to the third way politics of Blair's new Labour, to the regime of austerity and increased privatization of the co uh, Conservative-led coalition and Cameron and May's governments. Education policy has often been dictated by ideology rather than necessity. And as such, it can be argued that the main purpose of educational policy over the last 30 years has been dictated to by the ideology of neoliberalism. Small state, private ownership and driven by market forces, often with little consideration for the consumer, students. For me, if I saw that from an 18 year old, um, I would be marking that 28, 29, 30 out of 30 because that shows that they really, really understand um, educational policy and how it has worked. Of course, it could be argued to be quite politically biased. Of course, there are other ways in which you could approach this. However, for me, seeing that from an 18 year old um, would really say this is an A star student. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this um, video cast. I, I am relatively new to producing these videos, so there may have been some pauses. I'm also trying to record this while my twin boys are asleep. Um, so I've tried to rush through a little bit of it. Um, there are some other essays I'm gonna try and put up over the next few weeks. Uh, some of the areas which I think haven't been covered um, uh, by the specimen papers or by the AS papers, media and crime, I think is, is an area that um, could be explored a little bit further. Globalization and crime. Um, I know that sort of like lots of people are worried about that. Post-modernity and the family. Don't forget with the new specification, we've added personal life choices and the movement of the spec has, has, has been more about post-modernity. The impact of globalization on the family. Globalization, of course, has been added into the specification for topics like education and family. Uh, and as a consequence, you know, could potentially be in, the, in those questions. Marxism and crime. The reason I've selected this one is I think this is a tougher one for students to get their head around. Feminism and society, I think, is a nice essay that could potentially come up as a 20 marker. We are living in a postmodern age, again, linking into these ideas of globalization and the old favorite sociology is a science or sociology isn't a science because I think students do tend to struggle with that one. Um, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch. Hopefully um, this will help you with, uh, with your exams and best of luck.